Okay, good evening, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and begin. Uh, thank you for, for all coming out tonight. Uh, this is being recorded, and we're going to have it on mobile television for distribution for our communities, and I know our community has appreciated that. So uh, thank you to Bolton TV for being here tonight and making sure that we get this out there. Uh, but welcome, everyone. I'm Kirk Downing, Superintendent of Michelle Regional School District. Uh, and I have our professionals from Skanska uh, and Castle Blues Associates with us tonight. I think we should just go on down the line uh, and introduce ourselves, and I'll we'll start with Mr. Police. No. Thank you. Well, I'll just speak. I can hear me. My name is Joseph Police, and I am the um, chairman of the uh, building committee and representative on the district committee from Lancaster. Good evening. I'm uh, Greg Olson with Castle Blues. I'm an architect, the project manager, as well as an educational planner. Um, and I'm going to introduce members of my team over here. Sitting down is Joe Milani, who's the project architect, as well as the principal in charge, Paul Dominoff. And then I'll hand it over to Ann Williams. Thank you. Hi. So I'm Mary Ann Williams with Skanska. I'm the program executive. I'm here with C. Hi, I'm C. Nguyen, the project manager. We have here Dale, who's the project principal in charge. Principal in charge. Great. Thank you. So we're going to, um, at the risk of not repeating past presentations, but to for folks that weren't here, we're going to go very quickly through uh, part of the presentation that we had the last time, just so that we have a, uh, provide an opportunity for, for folks if they do have a question about a question about process that um, you have an opportunity to ask it. So we won't spend a lot of time, but we'll move through this quickly. So, um, starting at the beginning, uh, Skanska with the owner's project manager, our overall role in the project is really to be a liaison and uh, interact between the district, the Masco Building Authority, and to work in conjunction with the design team and their self-consultants. You'll see uh, Castle Blues Architects, they have a great history here with uh, public school projects and we're thrilled that we have them on this project as well. They bring a lot of expertise here and experience. This team has all worked together on other projects at the Minuteman Regional Vocational High School, as well as Attleboro High School, and uh, we're happy to be here together for this project. Um, if you look at um, this slide here, we talk about the Mass School Building Authority. It's a quasi-public agency, essentially the Mass School uh, building Authority is your partner here. They provide funding to the community for the for an approved project. That funding um, is supported through the Massachusetts sales tax, and uh, there is uh, reimbursement participation. They don't pay for everything, but they pay for a portion based on income poverty levels calculation that's done through the Department of Revenue. Okay, you'll see that uh, the statement of interest, which describes the deficiencies in the building, uh, was submitted to the Mass School Building Authority March 2019. Um, this is 2022. There's been three years of work prior to us getting to this point here. A lot of work that was done by the district, the school committee, school building committee, and putting together and identifying um, a plan and how to move this whole process forward state. So you should be commended for the work that's already been done to date. Uh, let's see, the, uh, oops, we'll go back for here. Okay, so the feasibility study uh, started in uh, the feasibility uh, invitation from the Mass School Building Authority came in April of 2021. Uh, well, since that invitation and uh, pulling together a school building committee, funding for the feasibility study, et cetera. Um, the, the school building committee has been very busy in, in working towards hiring an owner's project manager, being Skanska, and also uh, selecting the design for Castle Blues. Next slide, please. Uh, the uh, building authority uh, has a program. Uh, they call it you know, uh, feasibility study, which is known as module three and four. That information is on the Mass School Building Authority website. Um, what you'll find is that we look at the building facility, we look at what the, the 
challenges are to the facility and how does that impact the educational program. So for example, if you have a coat building and students need to wear coats uh, wrapped around them or blankets because the building is, is so cold, that's an indication of one way that uh, deficiencies in a building could impact uh, students in, in their learning. Um, also, you'll see here, uh, we've completed uh, module one and two, which was the eligibility period and then forming the project team. Currently, we are now in the preliminary design program. That's the process that we're going to um, speak more about tonight. Beginning of that process starts with the educational plan, uh, which has been put together by the district and their educational leadership and also visioning. You'll see a preliminary schedule here at the top where you'll see that we'll be uh, evaluating over the next few months existing conditions of the, of the, of the building, the educational visioning, which is, you know, what are we doing, what works, what doesn't work, we get feedback from students, parents, teachers, and what do we, you know, what do we want to look like in the future, what, what are our goals. And, um, and so out of that, we develop some preliminary uh, options to be considered about how to best support that educational plan and goals. And, um, and then uh, we'll submit it to the Mass School Building Authority for their review. It gets vetted by them with uh, a peer review with by another architectural firm uh, with the intent of supporting the district and making sure that there, there is a true feasibility study that's taking place here. Um, and I'm not going to get ahead of us. I, I think this is the time to jump to the next slide and to start talking about um, really what's been done today. So I'm going to ask you to take it over here. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Marion. So what we're charged with by the MSPA and by the Nishoba Regional School District Building Committee is conducting a feasibility study. And the main goal of that is to uh, analyze and investigate to find what's the most fiscally responsible and educationally appropriate solution. So in our first forum, we talked about some of the building deficiencies um, just from a physical plan standpoint. Um, but we're also and, and touched upon how it affects the educational environment. Today or tonight, we're going to be talking more about educa what, educational visioning and leading into the educational programming and what that really means as far as the educational environment of the building. Um, so you can see up here is all the different items um, that would, are included in a feasibility study. Um, most of the stuff we've been going through the process and we actually in the past week have started the uh, geotechnical evaluation and the traffic impact study um, and we'll be starting the educational programming here in the next couple weeks um, working our way through the process of finding what the most fiscally responsible and educationally appropriate um, solution is. Uh, so here, here's the big picture schedule um, as we're looking at and this is still a very tentative schedule. Um, what we do know is that we plan to submit the, the preliminary design program in this June. Um, to the MSPA for their review. Um, subsequent to their review, we'll be proceeding into the preferred schematic, um, which is where we'll then take a deeper dive into the investigations and the results of the investigations to ultimately, um, so that the building committee can select what is the preferred solution that they'd like to explore further um, as a result. And that solution is what is going to be believed to be the most fiscally responsible and educationally appropriate solution of taking the schematics on. Um, with that solution, we'll be able to establish a budget, and that's when it will be put in front of the member communities for um, support and funding, whatever project that is. We, we don't know what it is yet. We don't know if it's going to be an addition, renovation, new construction. That's all part of the process of what we're trying to find out right now. <coughs> so we breezed through this. We went through all this last time, but we wanted to make sure if there's any new faces here or um, people were, that saw the video um, last time, if there's any questions that have come up since then, we want to give an opportunity. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Um, we'll, we'll either repeat one or you can come to the mic, and if not, we'll just keep going. Okay, so we'll keep going. 
So what we, we're here tonight to talk about is educational visioning. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned, it's finding also what's the education, most educationally appropriate solution um, for the district. Um, and through that, um, we conducted a three-day summit and we facilitated um, a group um, that was an each day focused on different ends, which we're going very detail, which will lead into the educational program, which ultimately becomes the guiding document. It's, it's how education will be delivered in Michigan Shore Regional High School uh, for, the, for the foreseeable future. It is, um, it is not about a building. It's, it's more about education so that it becomes our document as architects that we look to to help inform us as we start to develop and design the building. So the visioning that just took back, place back in February, it included uh, 50 plus educators, parents, students, community members. Um, as you can see here, we want to appreciate uh, and thank everybody and recognize everybody that's listed up here, um, that they gave up time of their day for three days um, to spend with us. Um, you can see pictures of the group here. Um, it was really inspiring. Um, we've been doing, we've done a lot of these through our experiences and um, one thing I can say we all um, could agree is your students here are very impressive. Um, what was said by those students, the experiences we had with them, um, really speaks volumes to who you are as communities, um, what, what kind of education is already being delivered here, and, and the insight and the foresight by those groups. Um, I, I, even what I say can't really do the justice, but, so we do want to just say how amazing uh, of an experience. It was, it still gives me a little bit of goosebumps under my suit right now as I'm talking, kind of thinking about it. Uh, but these group, what we focused on was, from an education, why it's important. Well, we know your building that we're standing in here tonight was built when education was delivered in what they would call a teacher center, um, where it's a lecture base, just that that's facing forward. Uh, we all went through it. Like, it kind of fits at the Ford model of the assembly. Um, we all know that the world is very different than when we went to school. Um, we were all prepared very differently for you know, what we do for our jobs now. And as we look to prepare, prepare students for that 21st century workforce, 21st century learning environments look very different. Uh, we, we showed a little bit of it in our last presentation of how the school has done a great job to manage what they have with their existing facility. Uh, but that's been the mandate approach, and so what we want to do is take a fresh look, and through this process, we explore different ideas that have occurred throughout. Um, and I'm actually going to pause. Um, and just this video here was done by Sir Ken Robinson, uh, and uh, he says it better than anything that I could ever say. So I'm just going to sit back and let him explain why educational vision is so. Important. Every country on earth at the moment is reforming public education. There are two reasons for it. The first of them is economic. People are trying to f work out how do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century? How do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week, as the recent turmoil is demonstrating. How do we do that? The second though is cultural. Every country on Earth, on earth is trying to figure out how do we educate our children so they have a sense of cultural identity and so that we can pass on the cultural genes of our communities while being part of the process of globalization. How do we square that circle? The problem is they're trying to meet the future by doing what they did in the past. And on the way they're alienating millions of kids who don't see any purpose in going to school. When we went to school, we were kept there with a story which is if you worked hard and did well, and got a college degree, you would have a job. Our kids don't believe that. And they're right not to, by the way. You're better having a degree than not, but it's not a guarantee anymore. And particularly not if the route to it marginalizes most of the things that you think are important about yourself. And some people say we have to raise standards as if this is a breakthrough. You know, like, really, yes, I, we should. Why would you lower them? You know, so, I, mean, I, I haven't come across an argument that persuades me of lowering them. But raising them, of course we should raise them. The problem is that the current system of education was designed and conceived and structured for a different age. It was conceived in the intellectual culture of the Enlightenment. 
and in the economic circumstances of the Industrial Revolution. Before the middle of the 19th century, there were no systems of public education. Not really. I mean, you could get educated by Jesuits, you know, if, if you had the money. But public education, paid for from taxation, compulsory to everybody and free at the point of delivery, that was a revolutionary idea. And many people objected to it. They said it's not possible for many street kids, working class children, to benefit from public education. They're incapable of learning to read and write, and why are we spending time on this? So there's also built into it a whole series of um, assumptions about social structure and capacity. It was driven by an economic imperative of the time, but running right through it um, was an intellectual model of the mind, which was essentially the Enlightenment view of intelligence. That real intelligence consists in this capacity for a certain type of deductive reasoning, and a knowledge of the classics originally. What we come to think of as academic ability. And this is deep in the gene pool of public education. There are really two types of people, academic and non-academic. Smart people and non-smart people. And the consequence of that is that many brilliant people think they're not. Because they've been judged against this particular view of the mind. So we have a twin pillars, economic and intellectual. And my view is that this model has caused chaos in many people's lives. It's been great for some. There have been people who have benefited wonderfully from it. But most people have not. Instead, they suffer this. This is the modern epidemic, and it's as misplaced, and it's as fictitious. This is the plague of ADHD. Now, this is a map of the incidence of ADHD in America, or prescriptions for ADHD. Don't mistake me here. I don't mean to say there is no such thing as attention deficit disorder. I'm not qualified to say if there is such a thing. I know that a great majority of psychologists and, and pediatricians think there is such a thing. But it's still a matter of, dis of debate. What I do know for a fact is it's not an epidemic. These kids are being medicated as routinely as we had our tonsils taken out. And on the same whimsical basis, and for the same reason, medical fashion. Our children are living in the most intensely stimulating period in the history of the Earth. They're being besieged with information and calls for their attention from every platform, computers, from iPhones, from advertising volumes, from hundreds of television channels. And we're penalizing them now for getting distracted. From what? No. Boring stuff. <laughs> At school for the most part. It seems to me not a coincidence totally that the instance of ADHD has risen in parallel with the growth of standardized testing. Now these kids are being given Ritalin and Adderall and all manner of things, often quite dangerous drugs, to get them focused and calm them down. But according to this, attention deficit disorder increases as you travel east across the country. People start losing interest in Oklahoma. <laughs> They can hardly think straight in Arkansas. <laughs> and by the time they get to Washington, they've lost it completely. <laughs> and there are separate reasons for that, I believe. <laughs> it's a fictitious epidemic. If you think of it, the arts, and I don't say this exclusively the arts, I think it's also true of science and of maths, but let me, I say that they are particularly because they are the victims of this mentality currently, particularly. The arts, especially address the idea of aesthetic experience. An aesthetic experience is one in which your senses are operating at their peak, when you're present in the current moment, when you're resonating with the excitement of this thing that you're experiencing, when you are fully alive. An anesthetic is when you shut your senses off and deaden yourself to what's happening. And a lot of these drugs are that. We're getting our children to education by anesthetizing them. And I think we should be doing the exact opposite. We shouldn't be putting them asleep. We should be waking them up to what they have inside of themselves. But the model we have is this. It's, I believe we have a system of education that is modeled on the interests of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organized on factory lines, so ringing bells, sector facilities. Uh, specialized into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? 
Now, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are? You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. You know what I mean? Well, I know kids who are much better than other kids at the same age in different disciplines. You know, or at different times of the day. Or better in smaller groups than in large groups. Or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity, and increasingly it's about that as you look at the growth of standardised testing and standardised curricula. And it's about standardisation. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about changing the paradigm. There was a great study only recently on divergent thinking. Published a couple of years ago. Divergent thinking isn't the same thing as creativity. I define creativity as the, the process of having original ideas that have value. Divergent thinking isn't a synonym, but it's a, an essential capacity for creativity. It's the ability to see lots of possible answers to a question, lots of possible ways of interpreting a question, uh, to think what Edmund de Bono would probably call laterally, uh, to think not just in linear or convergent ways, uh, to see multiple answers, not one. So, I mean, there are tests for this. I mean, one kind of con example would be people might be asked to say, how many uses can you think of for a paperclip? Well, those routine questions. Most people might come with 10 or 15. People who are good at this might come with 200. And they do that by saying, well, could the paperclip be 200 foot tall and be made out of foam rubber? You know, like, does it have to be a paperclip as we know it, Jim? You know. Um, now, they're testing this, and they gave them to 1,500 people. This is in a book called Breakpoint and Beyond. And on the protocol of the test, if you scored above a certain level, you'd be considered to be a genius at divergent thinking. Okay? So, my question to you is, what percentage of the people tested, of the 1,500, scored at genius level for divergent thinking? Now, you need to know one more thing about them. These were kindergarten children. So, what do you think? What percentage at genius level? 80. 80, okay. 98 percent. Now, the thing about this was, it was a longitudinal study. So they retested the same children five years later, aged of eight to ten. What do you think? Fifty. They retested them again five years later, ages uh, thirteen to fifteen. You can see a trend here, can you? <laughs> now, this tells an interesting story because you could have imagined it going the other way, couldn't you? You start off not being very good, but you get better as you get older. But this shows two things. One is, we all have this capacity. And two, it mostly deteriorates. Now, a lot of things have happened to these kids as they've grown up. A lot. But one of the most important things that I'm convinced is that by now, they've become educated. They you know they've spent ten years at school being told there's one answer, it's at the back. And don't look. And don't copy, because that's cheating. I mean, outside schools, that's called collaboration. No, but inside schools. Now, this isn't because teachers want it this way. It's just because it happens that way. Um, it's because it's in the gene pool of education. We have to think definitely about human capacity. We have to get over this old conception of academic, non-academic, abstract, theoretical, vocational, uh, and see it for what it is, um, a myth. Uh, second, we have to recognize that most great learning happens in groups, that collaboration is the stuff of growth. If we atomize people and separate them and judge them separately, we form a kind of disjunction between them and their natural learning environment. And thirdly, it's crucially about the culture of our institutions, the habits of the institution and the habitats that they occupy. The reason we show that video is it's, it's not only entertainment value, uh, but it's powerful to help understand how education has changed uh, from when we went to school to how kids are learning today. Uh, and making sure that we're educating for the students of today and for the future. Uh, so that is, that is one of the main reasons why we do educational visioning. Uh, because we want to focus on the um, unique potential of understanding them and how um, what what that really could look like and what it looks like in the show currently, as well as where the show original is going. So what we've done is we put a quick overview of what 
happened actually during those three days. And so as we look up here, the first day was really about developing an understanding, an understanding of what is going on in 21st century learning around the world, around the country, as well as what's going on right here in the Shoal Regional School District. Um, that includes us doing the school administration, doing a snapshot of the, the schools currently, um, what is their, what has been defined in the work of what a portion of graduates should look like for the Shoal Regional, um, as well as the, the process of the education program currently, and learning modalities that are going on currently within the district, as well as what are some potential. So here you can see the members of the school district um, presenting a snapshot of their schools. Um, it was a very powerful presentation um, to help understand where the district is currently, to help understand where you have to know where you are now, and where you've been, to know where you want to go. The second day, we spent focusing on really ed what is the definition of education for the children. So we talked about what works in the district, what doesn't work, and what could be better. Um, we spent a great deal of, on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I think that is one of the more powerful things um, that the district has been working on, um, and the students um, celebrated and they brought a lot to the table as we talked about that as it being a priority of theirs um, for, for the new school project. Um, and then as well as exploring different educational pedagogies, um, as well as then just the general school organization structure. Um, and finally on the third day, um, we, took, we, we got back together and we took what had been talked about the first two days and brought it all together and thought, okay, what is what does education look like for the show in 20 years? What could it look like? Because when we're doing this project, we're looking 50 years. So we say 20 years, we talked about much longer than that, uh, but it's still, um, who knows? I mean, you think 15 years ago, no one even knew what an iPad was, um, and see how that's changed the world we work in. Um, so as part of that, we talked about the school transformation, finding spaces and space beyond the classroom. Um, and that is really about how the building can transform through the years, um, the flexibility and adaptability of it, um, as well as then taking everything and bringing it together to have a, uh, a design shred even, uh, talking about what, what a, a school could look like based on everything we talked about. Through all that, we guided principles for what we are looking for in, in the educational program and the education division we're created. Um, they're up here. Um, I'm not going to read through each one of them, but we, at the end of this, we're going to put questions up um, again, and if people want to circle back to these, we'll be happy to. Um, but these are some of the big picture items that we know as the guiding principles for whatever this project does that has to circle back to make sure we always address. Um, just some of the key ones that to pull out is the, the district's vision to develop independent, lifelong learners. Um, to teach 21st century skills, but at the same time teaching the traditional content. So again, not forgetting what you've done, your history, what makes the show great, but also looking towards the future. And then that led to the changing educational pedagogy, where it was, how do we, how could education be delivered here? How is it currently delivered? A lot of this is done now, it's just how could the building support that, whether it's project-based learning, student-centered learning, blended learning, um, COVID pushed blended learning in a lot of it and accelerated in the United States, as well as then the learning environments, um, whether it's learning comments, small group work, uh, social emotional learning, all different types of ways that students can learn and having a building that can support all those different aspects so that each, each student and each learner um, is given an opportunity to succeed in the way that they learn best. From there, it was developed what was called the whole school concept. And it was about bringing, not being a departmental based, in the sense of math, science, your your arts, but more of a whole school concept that's centered around what was defined as the center of the school, being whether it's a living atrium, a gallery, a cafe, a library, um, really the arts, the commons, congregational areas, spaces that are the community spaces that would bring the kids together 
um, that instead of being in, independent, um, but more uh, opportunities to bring the, the school and the communities together as a whole, as well as then creating small learning communities. And so what these are, what they call schools within a school, which is you're breaking the population down into smaller groups um, to allow collaborative learning, um, where the students get to know each other better for social emotional learning, the teachers get to know the students better. Um, so it provides much more independence, um, as well as it, it's been proven and studies shown as from a self esteem, peer to peer learning, um, that it's really it's building students for what we do in our work day every day, working with each other and learning each other and collaborating. And finally, as we look, is indoor outdoor connections. Um, and what that really is, is um, our innate connection to nature and using that to stimulate us, whether it's uh, health, fitness, and wellness, uh, outdoor learning areas, daylighting, um, because that, if you keep the mind active, the mind can learn. And so if you put someone in a windowless dark room, we all know that how that can affect you versus paying attention um, and being an active learner. So that was something that was very high in the discussions. And so in the end, we challenged superintendent to, um, everybody had to write on a postcard what uh, idea that they thought was a priority um, at the, at, in, in the final day and challenged uh, superintendent to go around the room and um, use his best um, ad-lib, um, I had to create the world's longest run on sentence. Yes, and you did a great job. So we uh, might have had a camera running, it wouldn't happen. So I just wanted to kind of play that. We are going to build a welcoming school for everyone that is flexible and adaptable, durable, and terrific, that integrates the sense of belonging, that is impactful, creative, showing a state-of-the-art experience that is comforting for all, sustainable, innovative, and quality. So there was a lot of hard work that was done over those three days. It was fun. Um, I think everybody learned a lot about each other, learned about themselves. Um, as well as parents, students, and teachers learning about the potential of what's going on there, that uh, 21st century education is more than just a buzzword, what, what, it, what it really means, and what it really means for Neshoba. Uh, so we wanted to, that was an intent to give a primer of what went on with that, what was talked about, some of the results of it. Uh, through this whole process, we're gonna be developing, uh, or the district's gonna be developing an um, educational program that we mentioned, as well as the educational visioning report um, that will be all part of this feasibility study. Um, but we wanted to give an opportunity um, tonight to have anybody asking questions uh, or have a really great two-way uh, conversation about what, what really came out of those sessions. Um, it's hard to capture three days worth of hard work in 30 minutes, so um, we wanted to give everybody an opportunity to ask any questions that they felt were pertinent um, as well. And, but at the end, we will have all the documentation will be publicly available as well. Thanks, Greg. You know, I, I want to just add a couple of thoughts. In the Ken uh, Robinson video, Sir Ken video, it was an interesting discussion of choosing that to the video as a way to you know, introduce this notion of school looking differently. And I have to tell you, I had the most amazing experience in the last couple of weeks. Um, it's related to my daughter. She is currently a freshman at Roger Williams in Rhode Island. She was a graduate of 2020, and coming out of that, um, playing college volleyball, she didn't want to be a freshman sitting in the dorm at that time by herself, sequestered with the volleyball team. So she took time off, decided to go to Roger Williams. But that's not the interesting thing that happened. I had to go down to pick her up at school, and I picked her up. And on the way back, she said to me, the most amazing thing happened to me today. And I said, what was that? And she said, I felt like I was smart. 
and at first, she's got this awesome self-deprecating humor, so we both kind of giggled about it. And I was like, no, tell me the story. What made you feel smart? And she said, well, we're in this geology class, and, and she's done very well while she's been there. And she comes out of the geology class, and they were, after a test, and there were three kids talking about the questions on the test. And she hears one of them say, oh, ask her, she's the smart one. <laughs> well, let me tell you, this is a kid that never took an AP course. She didn't take these honors courses or level courses or things like that. She felt compartmentalized from the time she was in elementary school through middle school, while her friends were set into these other tracks, through these other courses. But she didn't, she integrated with them in volleyball and basketball, but not in the hallways and the classrooms. So she'd been inundated with messages all through her schooling that she was not smart. Those other kids were smart because they were in the courses that were labeled. Uh, and then with gymnasium, applied arts, auto, uh, applied arts and auditorium nearby to each other with gymnasium things, but look at the outdoor spaces as well. And thinking about how these outdoor spaces integrate with the inner learning spaces. Um, Craig, can you go to the next slide? I'm wondering. So when you when you look at this, I know this isn't the slide because it's not in this particular slide deck, but I just want you to imagine in your mind that sort of that yellow shaded area. Imagine that as an outdoor space area. We had talked about there are some options where you replicate the inner space to the outdoor space um, right there as well. So these are concepts that we're thinking about. And, and integrating that into, you know, where are the areas that we're going to be studying that, that can draw, draw on that, you know. As we all know, uh, learning outside in New England winters is very interesting. Um, but that doesn't mean there's a good learning going on. Um, so we agree with you on that. It is where we find balance. And that's going to be the key to this. Because a portion of the, the Ken... Robinson video, he talks about that the model can be very successful for some. We can't abandon those some, but we have to make the opportunity for all happen and give kids opportunities to use all of their modalities, all of their skill competencies to acquire their knowledge. Some other thoughts on spaces. Yes. This might be an unpopular idea, but I didn't hear it mentioned, so I'll just throw it out there whether it came into the, uh, the visioning exercises or not, about the integration of community into the spaces, you know, more than just a Friday football game or something. Is there any discussion, especially given the communities that have so, uh, so uh, limited resources, about having the high school also be able to be a community um, uh, place to bring, bring folks together and maybe in, in some ways bring them together with the students as well? Okay, so the question was around uh, integrating the school, not just as a, sort of the bell-to-bell -bell learning environment, but how do you make the school integrate the entire community throughout the day and into the night? Did I summarize that? Yeah, it was more than maybe not in the day to disturb learning, but as part of right. the outside of school day. But, but the building being exactly. utilized much longer than just the bell-to-bell -bell day of, of teaching and learning. Uh, it's a critical uh, component, I think. Um, some of the things that we've, we've talked about with that is what are the types of things you could bring into your school to make that happen? Um, I actually have a meeting with Bolton TV tomorrow, as a matter of fact, because I think there's opportunities for partnerships with our local category access channels to build production studios in the new building. Build those partnerships, we build spaces, maybe get some equipment from those um, 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 folks and we should share that space. So you can use that space for video production and these types of events. Um, in opening up a fitness center, making your fitness center available until, you know, whatever that hour may be that we have to say, well, custodians have to go home too. Um, so I came from a school system previously where I thought the most exciting part about the, the high school was, and this was at Natick High School, we opened the fitness center at 6 a.m. The teachers and students would come in at that early hour, ready to exercise, work out, get started with their days. And employees across the district would come and use that facility like it was a planet fitness. And then they trickle into the library, trickle into the cafe. And then it just started this heartbeat of the day that worked into the day. And then if you were to go in in the afternoon, 
the social centers, kids were allowed to be social inside the walls of the school after the bell. They weren't all told to go out or go to their club. So you could see them in the library or some of the other common spaces interacting and doing that. That existed uh, through the evening into the, those evening sports hours. So I think there's opportunities to do things like that. I think there's opportunities for explore what time of day we're delivering education. So for instance, um, when, if you, you have some families where uh, you know they're having to help out at home for whether it's health reasons or financial reasons, and it just works better that they maybe take some of their courses in the evening, are there opportunities to do that type of thing? This is all the thinking that's on the table. So we break out of that just bell-to-bell -bell structure, passing period type of mentality, factory model, to introduce more integration. I could just add to that too, which is um, I think when we're looking at these projects too, uh, we're looking at <coughs> what is a, a flagship building to a district, to, to the communities. It's, uh, it's more than just a school. It's a civic building, a civic structure, um, and it's, a, it's an investment for all communities. So it's something that um, while, while we're talking about a school, it's about creating that flexibility that the superintendent down in mentioned too, um, so that it's not just used during school hours, but it's an 18 hour building, uh, a place that um, the auditorium can be used, uh, multi-use spaces like a, the flex space or black box that can be used by community groups, um, opportunities for that. Um, what that is, we don't know because we're still working through it, but it is creating, looking to create a, a flagship building for all of the member communities um, as a district building. Because um, it, is, it is an investment by all communities, not only in the kids, but in the communities. There's, you know, I think of a dream list of all the, all the things that we want um, in the school, and I, I know we're gonna reach that uh, point in time uh, Mr. Chairman, that we're going to have to say, well, let's start making choices. Mr. Downing, you can't have everything uh, because, you know, there are budgets to follow. But uh, imagine a scenario, Dr. Boynton and I talk about this all the time. Imagine a scenario where we have a technical theater set up that involves all of the technical computer programming um, that would go into theater production. And let's say you introduce this track. So as freshmen come in, they take these courses their freshman and sophomore years and come out with a certificate as juniors at a working age that they then can be the experts that are working the technical theater when the dance companies and private companies want to come in and use our spaces then our students can also be employed because we require them to use our experts on our equipment that we pay a lot of money for to keep that dynamic energy so those types of things we want to promote and grow Some other questions. Yes. Uh, I was I was uh, intrigued by the idea of working of having uh, different age groups be able to learn together mm -hmm. instead of having a year by year segregation of, of learning. Uh, did that come up at all in your conversations? Yeah, it did. It's interesting the things we create, what they teach our kids. The group in our visioning sessions that was the strongest against that was the students. We've taught them that they need to exist in their box. So as, as Ken talked about, you're producing these boxes according to your you know, data production. Um, and they develop that and then that's what they are accustomed to. That's how they do lacrosse. That's how they do basketball. That's how they do dance. They're in these groups. And so we talked about that and, and what the divergence would look like in learning communities. So yes, we, we are in those discussions. I think we have a lot of things to examine in our educational program that promotes this notion of, of uh, uh, tracking or being locked into a certain expectation. I, I have to reach back for it and it was something I read years and years and years ago about a school system in Alaska um, 
where the, the, the dropout rate was somewhere near 90% because uh, the kids figured out going to work in the oil fields as soon as you're um, age eligible was far more profitable than waiting to graduate high school. So we know the superintendent did, got rid of grade levels and just said, these are all the courses that you need to graduate. Uh, the state allows you to continue to go to school until you're 22. You can take courses at night. We just want you to eventually reach all these graduation requirements. In five years, they went to a 90% graduation rate. I mean, there's a lot of lessons that have happened out there in education that can teach us how we can rethink these things. But I can tell you, and, and this is just, um, I think a forecast of the community conversations that we're going to have. My former school system in Colorado, the Cherry Creek School District, was on the national news recently. Uh, do you know what for? They absolutely desecrated one of the most valued American traditions. They got rid of valedictorian. Eliminated it. No longer had it. And it blew up. Now, what's interesting is the flagship school of the district, Cherry Creek High School, uh, did not have valedictorians for the last 30 years. But because of the rest of the district adopted it recently as a district-wide policy, um, it became national news. So when you start to challenge some of these norms and, and some of these established practices out there, it, there'll be sticky conversations around that. Because there is something all of you are experts of and everyone that uh, sends a child to our, our school system is an expert in, and that is school. Everybody had to go through it. And for those that went through it successfully, they want that copied and repeated for their kids oftentimes. Because that's how they define what good education looks like. So for kids that struggle through that, it's really hard. Um, my oldest, uh, I, I would say I'll, I'll, I, I am not going to be at work, uh, Mr. Chair, next Thursday and Friday because I will be at my daughter's graduation at the University of Colorado. She is an artist and she's graduating with an environmental design degree. She has not taken an exam in four years. It's projects, some papers. It's building, right now she's building furniture prototypes for her capstone project, right? So there's other, there's so many pathways for young people to be successful out there. Let's capitalize on that. Because I'll just be honest with you all, as, as I gave my entry plan, uh, to, the, to the school committee just recently, I did state here, we over rely on sit and listen in our school system and in compliance. We need to be thinking about project-based learning. We need to be thinking about personalized learning. We need to think about how do we keep, give kids voice and choice in their learning while still holding them to academic rigor standards, but allowing them to produce what they know in ways that are non-conventional. So we have a very conventional system, school system right now, with pockets of that, but that is something we have a lot of professional development to do and we need to continue to grow. I can tell you right now, Dr. Locker, who led us through the educational visioning, uh, we, we were so enamored with, uh, talk about divergent, um, with his, his style, his presentation, his ability to engage that, that we contracted with him outside of the building project to come back and do that work with the high school faculty so that they can gain some of that experience as well. So I know Dr. Boyden has plans for that and, and how we're going to continue to grow that model. And I will say, I believe our high school educators uh, are, are receptive and open and looking at it as here's an opportunity to grow. This is the time. Any other thoughts or questions? I can talk forever about this things. Yes. Um, so I don't know if it's a, a question or a thought. It seems like this is a great opportunity as we're talking about, you know, what, what classes can kids be mixed and mingled in. It's building projects is like a great opportunity 
to promote and, and really encourage students to take elective courses. And I hope that the building, as you're thinking ahead, is really considering how they can be encouraging that of other students if it's not already required. I don't know how that cool. um, But how they can be how they can be participating in elective programs that are really rich and um, offer different social emotional learning opportunities as well as opportunities for creative and, and diverse thinking as well. So I think that's really important as you guys are looking ahead. Is, you know, I saw gallery up there. I think that's a crucial thing. It's not just to take the class, but to have other students appreciate that space and what goes in that space and how it's facilitated, which goes back to, in some ways, how do you engage your community? Um, Don Clifton wrote uh, Now Discover Your Strengths. Um, Marcus Buckingham was, was his father. He's telling the story. Marcus Buckingham goes in to talk to the teacher, and the teacher says, I need to talk to you about your son, Don. Yeah, what's, what's going on? Oh my gosh. He's an unbelievable mathematician. He's doing great. He's nailing these things down. He's so engaged. He's such a good learner. He works great with the other kids. Super. What's the problem? Man. When we start doing the reading and writing stuff, that's where he starts having trouble and we're seeing him act out and these different things. It's like, oh, yeah, that's it, I got it. And the teacher said to him, so what do you think we can do about this? And he said, well, it's easy, isn't it? And she says, what do you mean? Give him more math. <laughs> <laughs> it's not hard for what happens. Right, he said, give him more math. If that's what he's good at, just give him the math. Let's do some more math, right? And he, he, you know, he goes on in, in Now Discover Your Strengths to talk about, we really need to be thinking about a strengths-based approach with our students and thinking about a competency-based approach. And you can do that through electives. What I can say is that when we are looking at the, the Mass Core, um, as, as required by the state of Massachusetts, that's four years of English, four years of math, three of science, three of social studies, two of world languages, one art, and I'm forgetting the PE requirement. Every year is PE, right? So it's like, oh, well, what room do we have left in our electives? Um, I do know Dr. Whiteman is examining closely our course of studies. Guys, we have a course of studies for an 800 person high school that is massive. It's a lot, a lot of courses. Well, but the, it is time that we examine our course of studies and think about what are the courses that we're offering. Look honestly at the leveling system of these courses. Because for some school courses, you can find up to five different levels on a particular course. So we gotta look at these things and say, how do we look at our courses, offer parallel courses that raise the same competencies but might give some more kids choice? How do we integrate ELA courses with social studies courses to create some humanities type courses that that meet those graduation requirements, as well as STEM initiatives, as well as integrated arts with bringing the theater into uh, the tech ed lab. Those are the types of things we need to be doing. Anything else? Well, I feel like this is kind of preaching to the choir tonight. It sounds like folks are, are um, receptive to these things. I, I do think it's also, there's an honesty to this that pulls us into it. You know, APs and ACTs and SATs and how college admissions are looking at students and bringing them in. More and more colleges today, guys, are not looking at those things. And um, I told you a story about my daughter earlier. She has had a great experience at Roger Williams. She wants something a little bit different. So she's going to transfer. Looks like she's going to transfer to UMass. Sorry, Craig. She's going to transfer to UMass. But what she figured out was, hey, wait, I went to college and I figured out how to be a student. And now, look at all these other choices I have. That she didn't have to make the choice of her education when she was 17 and forever that it be. You can change your mind. And that's the key. Can we build these skills and competences 
in their students so that students can change their minds and apply them to areas of passion and inspiration for them, that's when you get into economic development in the community, as opposed to complacency. When you are working and building upon the things that give you energy. And that's what our goal is going to be. So we have a lot of work to do. I know these guys have heard a lot of, of sort of my rambling on about these things in terms of what we look at, but it really the vision process was all about bringing these, this sort of cross cut of our community together to go deeply into these discussions. So uh, if we don't have any more questions, I think we can wrap it up. Anything else to hear from uh, Marianne or Craig time? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Chair, anything on any, uh, to add to the... I actually, Craig, you might think Thank you. Uh, very briefly, <clears throat> to be, um, Mr. Olson had made some comment earlier in the evening about you know the difficulty in synopsizing three days of visioning into you know a one or two hour uh, forum, and I'm going to make an attempt to do that, Craig, right? because I think there was something I was not part of the visioning team, but I was there as an observer, and I'm not an educator, so what I heard absolutely fascinated me in one particular level. Dr. Locker talked about. Um, a particular project-based learning assignment. And when I listened to it, I said, oh my God, I want to do that. It had to do, the assignment was, you have to open a restaurant in Paris. And it wasn't like you did this on an ethereal level. No, you were going to go online. You're going to identify a commercial broker in Paris. You're going to contact that broker and have that broker identify for you actual buildable commercial space. You will develop a menu. You will price it in dollars. You will convert it. You will convert your dollars to arrows. And by the way, if anybody thinks I'm mispronouncing that, my mother-in-law tells me it's from Portugal. Tells me it's pronounced arrows, not euros. In addition, <laughs> that's what she tells me. I've been saying euros. All the the students involved in this assignment interfaced with students in France to get ideas and to understand concepts. It was absolutely fascinating. And somebody who you know went to high school back when dinosaurs rolled the earth. Uh, listening to the, the, the future of education just absolutely made me so jealous and envious. I really am envious for the children of our district, and I really hope that this is something, these types of assignments, these types of projects, what we can bring to our kids in this district. Thank you. You know, Mr. Police and I often have our, let's call them that, like follow up to the game kind of conversations, and we, and we kind of check each other's thinking. And I remember him saying, I mean this really in the most positive of ways, but it was virtually absurd what we did for these three days. And he said, but in the best way. And I, I love that quote, um, Joe, because we need to be more absurd when we're teaching and learning. We need to do things that are more absurd and less conventional, less robotic, less industrialized. Because if we're doing those things, we're going to give our kids more opportunities to make the choices that ultimately they're going to own. And that's what we need to do. We need to give our kids the skills to make good choices based upon what gives them life and energy. So uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, we'll continue to update. Please, uh, we'll go to the last slide. On all of our presentations, you're going to see a QR code. This is the QR code to the building committee uh, website. This is where all the governmental aspects of the, the project will be happening. Eventually, when it comes to political activism in terms of getting out the vote, this committee, we don't do that. We're forbidden by law actually to do that. So this is where you're going to get the business, where you're going to get uh, uh, the information about how to bring the project along. That's not coming for a while. That'll be a different set of folks. But just uh, scan that QR code and you can follow the work that we're doing. So thanks everybody, have a great night. Just in one, one last thing. Um, yes, that website is more a fact-based website to keep everybody informed on where we are and the facts of the project. Um, we will be doing this again in another few weeks, just like we did last time for this. Um, with an additional topic, we'll regroup um, what we've done tonight uh, with the group as well as adding more and more information and just keep everybody updated um, on progress, but solicit your feedback as well because it is very valuable and we thank you everybody tonight for your feedback. Thank you everyone.